initiated by the International Peace Foundation, an independent non-political foundation, under the common patronage of the 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. Thailand has been chosen for the following reasons. The Thai nation and its people, with their self-confidence, open-mindedness, and tolerance, provide a creative pathway towards peace, which could serve as an inspiring role model for the prevention, mediation, and solution of conflicts. Under the wisdom and spiritual leadership of His Majesty the King, as a shining example for inner and outer peace, a democratic Thailand has the ability to promote peace and the potential to stabilize the region. It has a rich, diversified network of national and international organizations, including business, diplomats, media, and NGOs, which provide the ground for an enhanced intercultural dialogue. Dialogue, the culture of peace and nonviolence are deeply rooted in Thai society, not only as concepts, but as a common practice in the form of and the process towards the middle way. Based on this knowledge and wisdom, Thailand could become an international platform from which the spiral of violence and racism, which dominates the world today, could turn into a deeper understanding towards aspects of peace and pluralism, which have been neglected far too long. To promote the kingdom as a center for dialogue and international understanding, the International Peace Foundation has invited 24 Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and economics to join hands with Thai leaders in all parts of society in a series of more than 200 lectures and dialogues, seminars, workshops, and conferences to be held in Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Hong Kong, and Song Tha. I'm grateful for the wide support the people of Thailand have provided for the preparations of bridges, dialogues towards a culture of peace, which draws its inspiration from the tireless efforts of His Majesty the King for peace and prosperity of all peoples, cultures, and religions. I thank Professor Joshua Leda and all keynote speakers who waived their honorarium for the benefit of the events. Professor Tak Chai Smith and Chulalong Khan University and all sponsors and partners for their important cooperation and generous contributions and the volunteers of the organizing staff who serve in an honorary capacity and I welcome all participants joining us in the upcoming events to step towards a culture of peace to dialogue, understanding and mutual respect. The UN the United Nations did declare the decade for a culture of peace and non-violence. Unfortunately, like with so many good initiatives of the United Nations, people don't know much about this. This was one of the reasons why our International Peace Foundation wanted to promote and work closely hand in hand with the United Nations to also contribute to the shift from a culture of war to a culture of peace. And this is all about this decade. And this is this series of events here, bridges, dialogues to a culture of peace, is about this shift in our paradigm is about this shift in our culture. Your Highness, ladies and gentlemen, if we ask people around the world, are you for peace? I think practically everybody would say, yes, we are for peace. 
definitely, we are for peace. But if you ask them, the people, but what is peace? Then uh, people start to smile and, uh, and they don't really know how to say it because this is in some ways the problem with peace that we don't know what is peace so well, but we know what is not peace. So everybody of us understands if this is a not peaceful situation in which we are, whether it's at home or whether it's out in society. But if it comes about to speak about peace, then we are not so sure anymore. But ladies and gentlemen, your highness, peace has to do a lot with love, with harmony, with consolidation, with serenity, and there are different forms of peace. And this is inner peace, this is what all kinds of religions and spiritual attempts and traditions are about. This is to achieve the peace inside your heart, to achieve the peace inside your mind. And then there's outside peace. And outside peace is something which is, as I said earlier, not easy to define. But it has something to do with love and cooperation and harmony. Now, for us, we define the culture of peace in the following way. A culture of peace is a global culture which is organized with the only or the main purpose to promote the full realization of every human being. In a culture of peace, everybody has the right to choose what self realization means for him or for her. Self-realization then is any point between the mere satisfaction of the basic needs as they are expressed and defined and guaranteed, ladies and gentlemen, guaranteed in the human rights. So this is the minimum which humans have to have to live a life as human beings to live a life in dignity as human beings and not to live in conditions and like animals. So this is the minimum what we can and have to work for to guarantee to people. And the maximum, ladies and gentlemen, is the expression of the full human potential. We don't know, and maybe Professor Lederberg can tell us something about this and many of the other scientists uh, which are coming out of Thailand, we don't know what the full the realization of the full human potential means. We know from science that we just use maybe 10, 15 percent of our brain every day. Just 10 or 15 percent. So let's imagine a culture which is full of love, harmony and creativity where humans are growing, where we can use our potential in a much better way to help each other, to assist each other, to inspire each other. Ladies and gentlemen, this is key peace about, and this is the culture of peace about which we are talking and which we are helping to promote, and which, if we cooperate, ladies and gentlemen, if we cooperate, we can bring about this shift from a culture of war to a culture of peace. And we contribute here and with your support, and the sponsor's support, and the universities and academic support, uh, we hope that we go together a little step further in the direction to implement the culture of peace. Thank you very much.
ที่ให้การสนับสนุนการจัดการวิทยาพิเศษโดยโปรเฟสเซอร์เจอร์โคเลเดอร์ผู้ได้รับรางวัลโนเบลสาขาการแพทย์ปี1958รู้สึกปลื้มปิติอย่างยิ่งที่ใต้ฝ่ายของพระมหาสมุทรพระมหาพระมุนาสเสด็จพระราชดำเนินสมบัติจากวิทยาในวันนี้ในการที่มูลนิธิสันติภาพนานาชาติซึ่งเป็นองค์กรที่ส่งเสริมกิจกรรมสื่อสารสันติธรรมได้เลือกประเทศไทยเป็นที่ชุมนุมแห่งปราบจากทั่วโลกเชิญผู้ได้รับรางวัลโนเบลสาขาต่างๆมาบรรยายและแสดงปาฏิกถาภายใต้โครงการสารสัมพันธ์สู่สันติปัญญาธรรมนี้จำเป็นการแสดงให้เป็นที่ประจักษ์แก่นานาประเทศว่าประเทศไทยเป็นดินแดนที่ไร้กันแบ่งแยกไม่ว่าจะเป็นเรื่องของเชื่อชาติวันนักและศาสนาเป็นประเทศที่มีความสงบสันติสุขและเป็นประเทศที่ประชาชนมีจิตวิญญาณที่ฝัดสันติภาพแท้จริงเพื่อร่วมภาคภูมิใจในกิจภูมิของประเทศไทยและประชาชนคนไทยธนาคารกสิกรไทยจึงได้ร่วมสนับสนุนการจัดโครงการนี้ซึ่งจะมีผู้ได้รับรางวัลโนเบลสาขาต่างๆจำนวน22ท่านมาบรรยายและแสดงความตระหนักเป็นระยะระยะตลอดเวลาสามปีนับแต่ปีไปคนไม่ควรแม้แต่สองพระคุณาเราตัวเองสิ่งที่ลายบนมาร์ส
by playing an active role in the Mariner and Viking missions to Mars. He has also been a consultant on health-related matters for the U.S. government and the international community. For example, having had long service on the World Health Organization's Advisory Health Research Council. He was a consultant to the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency during the negotiation of the Biological War Weapons Disarmament Treaty, which he remembered as, and I quote, by far, my most extensive extramural commitment exceeds all others combined, end of quote. He has been a member of the National Academy of Sciences since 1957, was a charter member of the Institute of Medicine, and was elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancements of Science in 1982. He received the U.S. National Medal for Science in 1990, and the list goes on. His passion and interests, however, lie not only in pure sciences, but also in improving communications among scientists, the general public, and government policies. Makers. He had written extensively for lay audiences, ranging from Aleto to Ann Lander in 1977, educating the public on Should Cousins Marry, to a weekly column syndicated for several years by the Washington Post on the social impact of scientific progress. He wrote over 200 editorials on bioethics, environmental hazards, and emerging infectious disease. Presently at age 78, Professor Lederberg continues to research, lecture, and pursue his interests at the intersection of science, policy, and society. In April 2001, he wrote to the president of MIT, offering to volunteer to become a guest lecturer as well as a student at the MIT OCW or Open Courseware Initiative, a free and open educational resource for faculty, students, and self-learners around the world. And I quote, I will personally avail myself of the opportunity to further advance my own education. I am mentor to some brilliant prodigies of high school age. Let me be the first to volunteer to be placed on your roster of visiting guest lectures. Without much further delay, Your Royal Highness, Your Serene Highnesses, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Joshua Lennon. We've only 
begun to contemplate the implications of the 21st century human condition, which is a radical departure from what we have known up until the last few decades. So radical we've only begun to understand its implications. We, we think we know something about the global economy, but there's also global traffic and materials and peoples and ideas on a scale and a rapidity which has no precedent in human history. Population crowding, often in huge conurbations, which will number the tens, the twenties, and fifty millions of people in very close quarters. Typically, in close proximity to jet aircraft airports, which now count almost two million passengers per day down to international destinations. And all of this is compounded by intense stratification of material income and the health services. Under these circumstances, it is perfectly predictable that we will see outbreaks of infectious disease often originating in the condition of poverty, very close crowding, poor hygiene, or health services. ที่มีความสุขที่ดีที่สุดในโลกนี้ที่มีความสุขที่ดีที่สุดในโลกนี้ที่มีความสุขที่ดีที่สุดในโลกนี้ที่มีความสุขที่ดีที่สุดในโล
So it is no surprise that all that was available for SARS was the classic repertoire of case identification, isolation, and quarantine. A quarantine not only within the hamlets and villages, apartments and cities, but at international borders at a price of enormous disruption of uh, international traffic of the economy. And there was no part of Southeast Asia and no part of the world, but especially in Southeast Asia, there was so very considerable economic loss as a byproduct of the defense uh, against the further spread of the disease. You, you saw this here in Thailand, it's very pronounced in Singapore, and so forth. So all we had available was case identification and quarantine. We had no specific remedies. We could only hope to isolate individuals who came down with disease to give them nothing more than supportive therapy and, as I said, depending on setting between 3 and 10 percent of the identified cases were lethal pneumonias, more often affecting some older individuals. Wherever and whenever the political will was consolidated, this was effective and did succeed in containing the outbreak of 2002-2003. I'll remind you of some of the particulars of the outbreak. This is the day-by-day -day, uh, accrual of cases, uh, the large majority of them in China and in Hong Kong for the worldwide distribution. You can see that there were warnings of it as early as January but the disease was not recognized as a new entity until the more severe aspects of the outbreak and its spread into Hong Kong that occurred in February and then exploded again in March of the previous year. Then remedial measures of containment were put in place and there was a gradual lessening. Uh, and then by June, there were essentially no further cases. To what extent this decline was assisted by the change of season because many respiratory infections, again for reasons we really do not understand following the season of time. Think of all the colds and the flus and so on that we have in the winter. Different infections having different precise peaks of their occurrence, and then they die away over the summertime. So now fall is back again, here we are in the middle of November, and we keep our fingers crossed as to whether or not there will be recurrence of SARS more likely in China, but possibly elsewhere in the world. It will take the next few months before we can run. The main outcome the cases are very bad in the newspapers, and then the bottom line, uh, by this population, just under 800 uh, lethal casualties concentrated in. China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Canada, and Singapore, and a small handful elsewhere. Now, after the epidemic was over, we had any number of people saying, well, well, what's all the fuss? On a scale of the millions of deaths that we see from measles, malaria, tuberculosis, diarrheal disease, HIV, AIDS, and the tens of thousands from syphilis and meningitis, here we can't even put 813 deaths on the scale. And what is that visible? We have to use different methods. Well, that's all well and good now that we have hindsight and have the success of containment. The measure of the significance of SARS is not how many people died, but how many people would have died if we did not have the machinery and the will and the insight to adopt the containment measures. And there's every likelihood that SARS would have reached the list of winners in the beauty contest to match these other elements if we did not have uh, the luck and the fortune and the will to finally get on the case. There was some stumbling. Uh, the immediate response uh, in China was less than one might have wished. The political authorities have recognized that place the then operators, health officials, with those who are more sensitive to dealing with these issues in a perfectly candid and effective way. And since that time, the global management of the SARS outbreak 
has exceeded every precedent of global cooperation for a common peace, peaceful purpose. And great economic cost, but with the potential savings of many tens of thousands, if not millions of lives on that occasion. So to that extent, it is a success story. In this pause, you might contemplate the prospects of other new emerging infections, where they might come from, what if anything we can do to raise our guard. We have to be about quite humble with all the successes of the genome projects of getting the DNA sequences, not only in the human genome, but in many other animal and plant species, and by now of many dozens of microbial species that we have a great deep understanding of their genomic constitution. We have to say we know virtually nothing of the ultimate evolutionary origins of viruses. They're very disparate. They bear little, evolution, little evolutionary relationship to one another. From time to time, we can see pieces of whole genomes incorporated into viruses. But whether those are primitive events or part of the further evolution of viruses as they live in various hosts is already problematic. Depending on a host's elaborate metabolism, which they hijack for their own purposes, they are unlikely to be primitive. They can only evolve in the context of very complex organisms. And likely most viruses will be found to be offshoots of host genomes that have broken away from uh, our own uh, makeup and those of other plants and animals and then evolve further. And these in turn may be a symbiotic origin. So organelles have evolved of the close association of bacteria with hosts. For example, the organelles of the called mitochondria, uh, the little uh, tube-like structures in which there are hundreds or thousands living in the cytoplasm of every one of our cells, and are the furnaces with which we burn uh, outside food and generate the energy and the substance of our own metabolism. These are almost certainly evolved from symbiotic bacteria that entered a primitive cell, perhaps in a parasitic relationship, and has then evolved into a more mutualistic one. The mitochondria could not survive without us, and we could not survive as air-breathing creatures if we did not have the mitochondria living within our cell. We often think of the mitochondria as serving a very important service to us, but you might as well equally argue that all of our labor in the acquisition of food and of the inspiration there is to, in order to provide a shoveling the fuel into the furnace that the mitochondria offer and are burning up that food within every cell of our body. So there are also many sources of DNA, which I to read as RNA, that are involved in further microbial evolution. <clears throat> I want to remind you of other outbreaks that we have seen just in the last few months. Uh, we had a scramble about a very close relative of smallpox, which is endemic in monkeys in Central Africa, which has uh, limited transmissibility to humans for reasons we do not understand. Is a moderately important affliction of some of those monkeys. But it turns out that ground squirrels, which are often used as pets in the United States, are also a host for the monkey problem. And they're also called prairie dogs. And they live in little burrows in the Midwest. Uh, but they turn out to be also very susceptible to monkey pox, which in the Midwest America outbreak just a few months ago had been derived from exotic pets that had been imported from Africa, carrying the monkeypox and then transmitted to other pets in the same stores. And it was quite a task to round up every prairie dog that was offered for sale in five or six states in the Midwest to make sure that they did not escape to the wild and contaminate the entire far west population of prairie dogs in the United States and might very well become a constant threat. To, uh, uh, as, a, as a new and wild source of this particular virus. We had the West Nile virus in New York uh, in 2002, uh, and uh, this grew very, very rapidly as a mosquito-borne disease. We would see 
seeing dead crows lying in the streets in New York City. Crows apparently were very, very susceptible among the bird population. But the bird carriers, bitten by mosquitoes and then bitten by, bitten by humans, also transmitted the disease to human sources. And then it should have been predictable, but it was really quite astonishing how quickly the West Nile virus reached not only the mosquito population with its erratic cases, but contaminated our blood supply when blood donors who inadvertently had been infected by the West Nile virus also gave their blood, and that blood in turn was transmitted to other people. So we had one more thing to worry about in protecting our blood supply, a totally new and exotic infection. West Nile had been known, obviously, in Egypt from its name, in Romania, and in Israel, uh, and in Russia, but in very limited outbreaks. Exactly how it came to the United States, we don't know. But in the course of three years, it has spread from being a local New York phenomenon to being one that essentially uh, every, every part of the United States is there to. And uh, it's not the top of my list of concerns, but I'll be quite surprised if it doesn't further spread around the world. And you may even see it here uh, in Bangkok or something. So one other example. And then the prime example of the emerging infection, which has had enormous consequences, is of course the AIDS pandemic. And here we see this very limited spread within the United States and how it takes off in an explosive fashion for the pandemic which is taking place in Africa where there are from two to four million case cases of stand in Africa right now. Uh, and with that very diligent effort, there are very variable record on this. Uh, states like Senegal and Uganda have initiated very effective others, there's been an intention to neglect it, as we have seen on the part of uh, South Africa, uh, which only has disastrous consequences in the world of this One has to congratulate the uh, health officials in Thailand uh, in the last two or three years, having undertaken a very vigorous response, but I can also say, why did it take so long uh, when the further progress of this so we have a panoply of well-established infectious causes of disease, which are the sort of groundswell of our concern. Mostly, these are the endemic diseases uh, with uh, endemic outbreaks from time to time, but we're, we're with us now year after year after year, and so they just have some 10 million of epidemic causes of things that have become all too familiar and which are in principle remediable. We don't always have perfect therapeutic agents, but we are on the track for a concerted political effort. We really took seriously as a matter of shared global concern. We could uh, control these diseases and very nearly eradicate them. They're beginning to increase that status on our priorities for our global health initiatives the last year or two, which are very, very encouraging, encouraging signs. They're only about 20, 20 years later than they need have been. Uh, and let's be grateful for what we have now in the mood and the political will that, yes, international cooperation could go a long way uh, towards the uh, attainment of these important grievances. And yes, they're not only problems of poor developing countries, they are problems for the whole world because there is no way we can isolate ourselves from their consequences. Then in terms of individual challenges, a slide I borrow from the CDC. Year by year, so we talked about just the last decade. So we could have picked any starting year. There would, there would have been a disease of the year anyone you care to name for the last time. Antivirus in the roads in the southwestern United States, plague outbreak in India, Ebola hemorrhagic fever, which comes back from time to time, and it's only a matter of time when there'll be a transmittal uh, to Europe as well. Um, 
bullet is a very fearsome disease. It can be controlled by reasonable levels of containment. We have no therapy for it. There are prospects of vaccine are not well developed. But there are good reasons why it is very scary to break out of this current natural habitat. Remarkably enough, although we're quite confident that Ebola has a animal reservoir where it slumbers from time to time, possibly without causing disease in that host, we do not know what that natural reservoir is. But bats are suspect, and still has to be found. We're quite concerned that we have to be quite humble about our accomplishments in many aspects of biology and disease. 1997 was a scare when a new form of influenza uh, appeared in Hong Kong. One has to congratulate the health authorities there. There's one person I always mention, the Secretary of Health, Margaret Chan, who took the most vigorous measures possible, and not politically very popular, in making sure that the disease was stamped out in the chicken markets and the wildfire reservoirs before the regular flu season would come along and we would undoubtedly exacerbate the spread of those new variant flu uh, along with the uh, more conventional flu that are coming out. This had every prospect of reminding us of what happened in 1918 where there were 25 million deaths from influenza worldwide, as many as there were combat casualties. Well, we got caught. There have been new outbreaks of H5N1 on my way to lethality. We don't understand what makes some sense.
And also, very importantly, in a way which also protects us from evolving too rapidly, we have speciated. Once we branched off from our chimpanzee ancestors, very promptly, we lost the ability to cross hybridize. Because that would have been too disruptive for the kinds of genetic adaptations that new species make as they evolve out of another one. So, uh, I won't say it could never happen that there would be a human primate uh, chimera. Uh, one thinks of that as a monstrous situation. And to all intents and purposes, it never happened. So there are many boundaries to cross-species hybridization uh, in animal and human species. So there's limited exchange of DNA, limited genetic cooperation. That has very important consequences in how we deal with disease. Because once our germline separated from that of the primate, the primate's evolution to defend itself against a simian immunovirus could help that genetic line, and there's no way in the world it could be of direct utility to human evolutionary experience. We become separate species and become unable to share genetic information until intelligence comes along, reads that information into genomic maps, and then uses this as part of rational medicine. So eventually we make up for the species boundary by the use of cultural intervention, uh, science, technology, uh, art, uh, as against the biology. And let's contrast that with our microbial partners. For a moment, say adversary. I call that the microbiome. You remember 10 to the 10th as an enormous population, tens of billions. 100,000 times more, almost a million times more, larger population. So millions and billions of cells characterize microbial populations. A single cell, a bacteria, typically can multiply every 20 minutes. We have some strains we go in our laboratory, a Vibrio, that doubles every eight minutes. That means in an hour, where one cell started, they can be 200. Three hours, you can have millions of organisms. In a day, there's not enough nutrients in the world to satisfy the appetites of all of the organisms. But in principle, could have been vital and thinking and growth. So very rarely do we see sustained exponential growth of microbial species. There are just too many of them, despite their tiny size. So you could crowd a billion cells easily into one test tube. They grow so rapidly in recent large numbers that uh, they, they simply are not sustainable. But that's another way of saying that they evolve very rapidly. Because they fluctuate in population size. The survival of the fittest reduces those populations with very small numbers of surviving individuals. We, we experience nothing like that in the mammalian, much less uh, human experience. So that all goes together with the, the 20 minutes. They're highly mutable in principle. Their DNA is much more readily exposed uh, to the environment. But in addition to that, speciation hardly occurs. It is promiscuous lateral gene transfer in the microbial world. In fact, you can think of the bacterial world as being one worldwide web of interchange of information. It's true. Bacteria give up pieces of their DNA quite promiscuously to be picked up by any number of bacterial species. Most consequentially for us, they do have a transfer of drug resistance, but that's where we most study. There's no doubt at all that many aspects of virulence in highly diverse bacteria come from the exchange of genetic information from various sources. And then, uh, we may synergize within our species. We domesticate a small number of animals, as you might say, uh, you know, our pets, our uh, work animals, that that's about the limit of, uh, that, uh, and our plant, the plant work is synergized with very, very extensively. But the bugs gang up on us. They cooperate with one another to cause disease that singly they would not be able to do and have a mutual cooperation society 
and inducing disease will be preventable. So that's our problem in competing with microbial evolution. What's the answer to it? I'll come back to my previous slide at the bottom of it. We have one ultimate capacity, and that's the evolution of our culture, the evolution of our intelligence, the evolution of social cooperation in coping with our environmental challenges. And so I use that slogan, it's our wits against their genes. Our wits are ultimately of genetic origin, but those that are kind of expressed in terms of our, and I stress the word social and the word cultural as well as intelligence. An intelligence that did not result in cooperation would be almost useless. In fact, it would be destructive if you had a single super smart individual who exploited his or her situation at the expense of the tribe, the tribe would suffer, and then the, the individual as well, because he or she could not survive at all. So one might well ask, with all these intrinsic difficulties,
The question is, has virulence of SARS been overstated? Well, that raises very interesting questions. We, we simply do not know the primary attack rate. But when I see what happened in the Alloy Gardens, uh, the incidence of infection in that one housing development, and the incidence of lethal infection, uh, there are certainly strains of SARS that have a very high variance. I suspect there's a great deal of diversity in different SARS strains. There's such heterogeneity, certainly in the spread. So uh, I don't think it's been exaggerated at all. But we don't have all the necessary information. We don't know how many inner infections there might be. Uh, and that would be good news because it would also suggest that developing a vaccine would be easier to do. But you know, whatever the details of SARS, there are contingencies. You know, one, one change at one base in the very uh, passive structure can transform this activity. Uh, we become used to influenza, uh, and although there are 50,000 deaths that might be attributed to uh, influenza, this complication of our disease in the United States every year, uh, so we don't even consider the magnitude of its effect. We did have the 1918 pandemic, and uh, the more we examine it, the more we understand how helpless we would be today if that were to recur. We have drugs with very limited capability. We have some. We have vaccines that could be very good if we only had them in time. But it's guaranteed we will not have them in time if there's another outbreak or characteristic. So in today's world, if we had another uh, uh, flu like that in 1918, there would be 100 million casualties. Next question is about uh, GMOs. Well, would it be possible for me to see the reading of the question? I, I can't hear you too well on the stage. You can see it. GMOs, genetically modified organisms, going to create new global infectious diseases. Well, we have to take very careful precautions in working with genetic modification of pathogens, and that's one of the reasons we have very high containment facilities. Uh, and uh, changing the categorical answer, because we don't know what wickedness and what evil uh, might be uh, put into that kind of enterprise. So uh, all I can say is we must take very careful precautions uh, in that matter. Without the use of the technology of genetic modification, we would not have known that HIV was a retrovirus. We could not begin to look at the questions of how to develop drugs for it, which that's the kind of vaccine. So we cannot forego by uh, doing research involving modification without losing some of our most important tools, but I certainly acknowledge that we need very careful precautions in dealing with that. We have a lack of procedures in the United States of governing uh, hazard uh, protection, uh, and uh, we we'll hope that uh, the rest of the world would adopt similar standards. The adoption of consensual standards for biosafety is one of the very important issues that do require international cooperation. And the existence of measure, but it could be improved and made more aggressive and enforceable. Next question is about the microbes do not want to eradicate us. What about our eradication of polio by human? Does it affect natural balance? That's a very interesting policy question that's with us right at the moment. We are on the verge, by the use of uh, polio vaccines, both the salt and activated vaccine and the same attenuated vaccine, uh, of all but eradication of polio. But we are quite certain that this will not be 
result in the elimination of the polio virus from the surface of the earth for two reasons. Well, the same vaccine is still a live polio virus. And while it continues to be used, and it's hard to see how it will be displaced, especially in poorer countries, because it is so much easier to administer, so much cheaper, in some respects, much more reliable, uh, that it will continue to be used. It has a certain rate of reversion or genetic reversion. It may not always be a spontaneous mutation, it may be a recombination of a different polio virus and two wild virus. But we had an outbreak of vaccine induced polio in Central Domingo uh, a year or so ago that brought that to our attention. But the other is that polio virus is excreted so readily that there are many, many uh, clinical specimens, biological specimens, and so on that are stored away in freezers, maybe even in other situations, that we still have polio virus on them. So we have to face the contingency that polio virus will still remain even after the disease has an observable uh, outbreak is with us. And we could imagine we have a situation where after 10 years of no polio, uh, reluctance to continue to vaccinate, we then have a totally immune herd, and then we have 12-year-olds and 15-year-olds seeing polio for the first time, where well, we know it happens most dramatically with effect in terms of paralysis. So there's still a great advocacy for continuing vaccination over a period of time, even after the polio virus seems to be eradicated. It's a very complicated question. I can't go into all the details of it. It is under very active deliberation at the World Health Organization. And it's very important that we have a very vigorous debate. It's obviously it's something we've only dealt with internationally. You can't, uh, you can't have eliminated polio in one country and not have it in another, and then expect that to be a state of situation for any time. But I'm very glad to raise the question. Could you please elaborate more on the link of health risk and peace? Well, we just have to see the disorganization of the economy and the political structures and the lack of confidence in government in Africa uh, to see how, it is, how disease is disrupted. But most importantly, it's the uh, impact, uh, the necessity of health for economic development. When you have a population that has not just the mortality, but the severe morbidity of malaria, and then on top of that, the tuberculosis, and then the expectation that these are people who will be able to work hard, produce enough food for themselves and for their families, and have enough savings for further economic development, to see what an essential health is for those kinds of economic and social development. I'm using peace in an extended sense, not just that. I don't, I don't expect that when a country becomes healthy, the human reaction of the host, and we have to get, get past that if we're going to get a vaccine. So, and there's another difficulty about malaria. Uh, malaria puts on a different clothing every day and changes its external garments and external objects. It has hundreds of genetically inborn alternatives to the kind of skin that it wears at any given time. So when a community develops against one, uh, it can shed that skin and put on another one. I think that's the greatest fundamental difficulty in developing a vaccine. But we have to keep that knowledge in mind, and we've not always kept it in mind in trying to think of how to develop a vaccine. Keeping that in mind, there's still a possibility of it. There would be such enormous advantages to a vaccine uh, as opposed to you know, many other approaches. That's worth trying even to spray control. I think we could do more injective control and more to control the mosquitoes than we've done uh, in the past. And uh, that, that can use all the intelligence that we can bring to bear. I don't have time to go into all the avenues of that. How long do you want me to go from the question? Not game, but what's the audience have? So I take one more question. Uh, you coined the term emerging infectious disease in 1989. This has been criticized by some reporters. For example, Paul Farmer. 
as carrying complex symbolic burdens. What is your response? Well, I pay great homage to Paul Farmer. I met him a few times. I think he's, he's a person who has devoted his entire career at a very personal level to dealing with AIDS and Haiti and doing this at the ground level where he lives with the people and he treats I have enormous respect for him. And I pay very close attention uh, to uh, what he's had to say. I've had some discussion with him about symbolic burdens. And I think when he brings this up, he's not criticizing me for using it. He's suggesting that I explore the symbolic burdens and the further implications of it. So whenever I talk about emerging infections, which have the context of instilling an appropriate degree of concern to the audiences who are not subjected to tuberculosis and malaria, and they may think not HIV, that they have other things to worry about as well. But at the same time, I do talk about the scourges that were up to the present time. So yes, we do have to keep this in balance. But uh, I say it's appealing to the short order self-interest of many of the audiences that I deal with to say, look, even if you don't care about malaria and TB, you better worry about SARS. You better worry about influenza. You better worry about Ebola. And you better worry about a host of other infections that have the likelihood, not only the possibility, of making you look like a third world country in your disease situation. So I do my homage to Dr. Farmer, and I hope I've answered what he wanted me to say in the symbolic program. So perhaps one last one from the Eden Flowers Public Health. Ethological balance is important to health. The question is whether disease eradication will affect that balance and cause more problems. Well, I can't not want to eradicate smallpox or polio or measles or any of the other major diseases. Our first order reaction has to be deal with the first order of impact. But then we must not forget that we have upset the normal ecological balance. That we are a naive herd if we're not very careful. If we abandon vaccination, we're opening the door to the microbes event, having upset the balance and no longer retaining our immunity that they may come into play. And that may be a much more complex process than single agent immunity one at a time. We do not know what role immunity to the natural disease of measles, as you might think of the case, has in the priming of our world immune system. And we don't begin to understand asthma. But there's a very credible argument that for one reason or another, the disturbance of our natural history of exposure to indigenous. Seeing them less often, seeing them at a later age of additional contact may have something to do with the emergence of asthma as an aberration in our immune reaction. Our immune system is so complex, we tend to think of one antibody against one agent. It's, it's much, much further removed from that. There are many aspects of what is law and native immunity that do not have that specificity. And whenever you immunize against a given antigen, a very complicated set of further reactions take place. So I would be the first to say that this needs much more detailed study and in the direction of the new ecology of the treated human host from which you have eliminated one pathogen by the use of a given vaccine or the use of a given antibiotic opens the door to a very complicated situation that my plea is not for premature action, but for post-mature research to have a better understanding of those new relationships. And it's a grossly neglected and treated disease. You know, most research on pathogens, we want an acute disease that we can induce with an intramural inoculation, that in 48 hours we have a very sick animal, that if you don't treat it another 48 hours instead, that's the ideal animal model of disease. 
totally unrealistic, totally artificial. It doesn't mean to play all the other secondary elements in the community and everything else. So we have to learn better models if we really want to understand the future. Thank you. 